All right, welcome back. Today we're continuing our RBT exam practice test series where we're going through the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please do us a favor and subscribe. If you're looking for our proven study materials, please check out rbtexamreview.com. We've helped thousands of RBTs pass their exam. Hopefully you are next. We offer practice exams, study guides, and our famous combo pack. Questions, comments, please let us know. We'd love to help. When you do pass, make sure you let us know as well so we can include you in our next Sunday shout out. Our most recent Sunday shout out was our most ever. So we are very excited about that. Other than that, let's work hard, study hard, and get to our questions. Question one, which of the following is the best description of an antecedent to a behavior? Now, what is the key word in this question? Remember, all our work should be done on the question itself. That's where all the information is that's going to lead us to the right answer. So when we're reading this, we're looking at the best description of an antecedent. So we're looking at the thing that happens before a behavior. And then a best description, as far as we're concerned in ABA, is what? Well, it's going to be objective, meaning not our opinion, but exactly what's happening. Hopefully, it's going to be measurable. Hopefully, it's going to be observable. Those are really the three main things. You want objective, we want measurable, we want observable. Now, we're looking for the best description. So we have four options. Let's pick the best answer, the best way to describe an antecedent. A, John hates being hot, so he turns on the air condition. Now, being hot is certainly an antecedent. But this word hates, hates is a state of mind. We can't measure and observe hate. Remember, the test is going to test you on your knowledge of our very strict fundamental ideas, right? And we don't base things on feelings and thoughts and diagnoses. Okay? We don't describe behaviors and antecedents and consequences in that way. So hates is not going to be a great description of our antecedent. What about James dropped his jacket, so he picked it up? That's fine. That is a behavior. James dropped his jacket. He picked it up. You can observe it. You can measure it. It's objective. It's much better than hates. Blaine has autism, so he avoids work. This is the worst way to describe any antecedent or any behavior. The idea that someone's diagnoses or disability is the cause of their behavior is what we're trying to avoid. If we just say the autism causes him to avoid work. Well, we can't do anything to cure the autism. How can we possibly address the behavior? So never, ever attribute a behavior to a diagnosis like autism. And then D, Glenn is frustrated, so he throws his pencil. D has the same problem as A, hates and frustrated, mentalisms, state of minds. Let's avoid that. Let's objectively define it, operationally define it, much more measurable way. So out of all these, the best description of an antecedent is going to be James dropping his jacket. In response, he picked it up. The antecedent, of course, is dropping the jacket. He responds by picking it up. You're teaching someone how to make toast. You watch as they grab a piece of bread. You then touch their elbows and guide their arms towards the toaster. As they get closer to the toaster, you quickly remove the prompt. What type of prompt are you using? This is a very specific type of prompt. And on a prompting question, remember, our two primary ways we prompt are most to least and least to most. Now, those are strategies, so most to least and least to most. We're trying to decide what prompt to use and when. Be careful if the question is asking for a specific type of prompt. If they're asking for a specific type of prompt, don't choose most to least, don't choose least to most. In this case, we're looking for a specific type. And our prompt is along the lines of observing the client, intervening physically, by guiding their arms, but then immediately removing the prompt. So essentially, you're only providing as much physical prompting as necessary and then quickly fading it right back. So what type of prompt are we using? A, least to most. Well, as we just talked about, we're looking for a specific type of prompt, not the strategy. So don't pick least to most. Either way, in a least to most, we're not going to start with a physical prompt. B, gestural. Gestural, you are giving some sort of indication you're doing a portion of the behavior, pointing, looking, giving an indication of what you would like done. However, gestural is not a physical prompt. And in this case, we are physically prompting by touching elbows. C, model. Model is like a more intense gestural. Model, you're actually 
acting out the entire, you're modeling the entire behavior for them, right? So instead of touching their elbows and guiding their arms, you would show them and you would actually do it yourself, right? Grab the piece of bread and put it towards the toaster. But again, modeling is not physical. D, graduated guidance is our only physical prompt on this list. Graduated guidance is using as much physical prompting as necessary, but then immediately fading it. So again, in this case, you're not prompting, you're watching them grab bread. Then you quickly provide minimal physical prompting by touching elbows, but then you quickly fade it. That is graduated guidance. Graduated guidance is a physical prompting where you're only using as much as possible and then quickly fading it back. A chocolate cake recipe calls for a 350-degree oven and a 45-minute baking time. If the cake does not bake for exactly 45 minutes, it will be inedible. How would you describe the baking time using a basic reinforcement schedule? Got to put on your thinking cap here. This is a very, very applied question to an everyday scenario. What are our basic reinforcement schedules? Start there. Let's break down the question. Well, we have fixed ratios, variable ratios, fixed intervals, and variable intervals. Ratios are based on responses. Intervals are based on time. Now, in this question, are we worried about responses or time? We'll read it back. The cake does not bake exactly for 45 minutes. We're worried about time. So eliminate the ratios and worry about the interval schedules. So we have a FI45 or a VI45. Now, what is the difference between fixed and variable? With fixed, our time, in this case, isn't changing. With variable, our time can change and is going to be on an average. So what is the key word here? And this is why you need to read the questions carefully. Very, very, very carefully. Do all the work up front. Because the key word here is this word, exactly. If you skip over this word exactly, it would be very easy to get this question wrong. But because they use the word exactly, it's indicating to us that 45 minutes is always going to be our schedule. It's not going to change. And if the 45 minutes isn't going to change, does that make the 45 minutes fixed or does it make it variable? Well, of course, it makes it fixed. So we are looking at a fixed schedule based on time and interval of 45 minutes. So how would you describe baking time using a basic reinforcement schedule? You would say it's on a fixed interval 45. The goal of a single choice stimulus preference assessment is what? Okay, we had a few challenging questions to start, and now we get into an easy question. And the thing people mistake on the RBT exam is thinking every single question is going to be a 10 out of 10 as far as difficulty goes. Not the case. There are going to be plenty one, twos, and threes difficulty. And when you get a one, two, or three difficulty, don't overthink it. Use your gut. Trust your preparation. Pick the best answer. I would say this is about a two or three difficulty question. Because we're looking at the goal of a single choice stimulus preference assessment. So really what you're looking at is the goal of a stimulus preference assessment or a preference assessment. So what is our goal of a preference assessment? Is it to A, identify reinforcers? It is not. Careful. We're not identifying reinforcers, okay? Or we're identifying positive reinforcers. Again, we're not. We're not identifying the reinforcers. We're doing C. We're identifying potential reinforcers. By looking at what the client likes, what the client prefers, we can potentially find reinforcers. Now, we need to do a reinforcer assessment later on to determine the actual reinforcing properties of these items. But with the preference assessment, at least we can get potential items to use as reinforcers. Identify punishers. No. How do we know if something is reinforcing or if it's punishing? How do we determine consequences? Well, we look at future behavior. If the consequence doesn't affect behavior, it is not a reinforcer, it's not a punisher. We're only looking at future behavior. If future behavior increases, it's reinforcing. If future behavior decreases, it's going to be punishing. So again, the goal of a, a stimulus preference assessment is what? It's just to simply identify potential reinforcers to later be evaluated as actually being effective to change behavior. RBTs must always maintain client dignity. Which of the following scenarios is an example of failing to maintain client dignity? All right, we have an ethical question. We have a client dignity question. Client dignity says we respect our clients. They're entitled to the rights that everybody is. 
food, water, bathroom, basic human rights. So we're looking at a scenario of failing to maintain client dignity. So three of these will be examples of maintaining dignity. One will not. A, during an assessment, a behavior analyst asks the client what their favorite snacks are. Are they maintaining dignity? Well, they sure are. They're getting the client involved. They're talking to them. They're asking their preference. B, while working, an RBT allows her clients to use the bathroom. Yes, that is just a typical thing. Again, we're not treating our clients differently. Treat them with respect and dignity that they deserve. C, because a client failed to earn 10 tokens, they were not allowed to eat lunch. Is it dignifying to withhold lunch from somebody as punishment? Absolutely not, right? Not at all. It's unethical. In many cases, it's illegal. You are not at all maintaining dignity by withholding lunch and withholding meals from our clients, okay? Do not do this. D, a client is allowed to eat lunch with peers without autism at school. That was That's a perfect example of maintaining dignity. Put them with peers without autism. They deserve that. Okay. C, however, is completely wrong. There's a difference between withholding dessert and withholding entire meals. Withholding dessert might be a manipulating operation. Okay. Withholding entire meals is unethical, possibly illegal, and definitely not at all maintaining dignity. So what scenario fails to maintain dignity, client dignity? C, because a client failed to earn 10 tokens, they were not allowed to eat lunch. On Monday, your client's mom asks you if you can do an extra session on Saturday during a family gathering. You would be working as an RBT, and your supervisor approved the hours. What does this represent? All right, don't overthink it, right? Let's break it down. Your client's mom asks you if you can do an extra session on Saturday during a family gathering. Okay, but you'd be working as an RBT, so picking up hours, and your supervisor approved the hours. Have you done anything wrong? Well, no. As long as you're there as an RBT doing applied behavior analysis work and your hours are approved, you've done nothing wrong. So is this an ethical scenario? It certainly is. Is it a conflict of interest? No, not unless you go as a friend, but based on information, and we only answer questions based on the information given, you're going as an approved RBT. A dual relationship, same thing. Unless you're going as a friend, and not an RBT, that's a problem. But if you're going as an RBT and doing RBT work, it's totally okay. Lack of dignity, it's not a dignity question. So this is totally fine. You're, at, you're working as an RBT, your supervisor approved the hours, you're going to provide therapy, totally fine. This represents an ethical scenario. You're trying to get your client to complete a math word problem. You ask them to tell you two jokes, which they love doing, and then ask them to do the word problem. What intervention are you using? Okay, think about it. Think about what we're doing here, right? We need our client to complete a math problem. Let's consider this our low probability request. So you ask them to tell you two jokes, which they love doing. So these are what? Well, they're high probability. They're preferred. And then you ask them to do the word problem. So if you ask someone to engage in a high probability response, or preferred response, and then follow it up with a less preferred response, what are you using? A, pre-MAC principle. What is the pre-MAC principle? The pre-MAC principle says you can use a highly preferred activity as a reinforcer for engaging in a lower preferred activity. It's basically the opposite of a high P request sequence. We're not using the jokes as reinforcing reinforcement. We're using the jokes to gain momentum to get them to engage in the word problem. So we're not using the pre-MAC principle. We're using a high probability request sequence. My high probability request is the telling of two jokes. My low probability request is do the word problem. High probability request sequence, also known as the high P request sequence, high P, low P. Either way, first comes low probability, then high probability. Pre-MAC principle, first comes low probability, then high probability. We're not shaping behavior here. Behavior is already in the repertoire. And we're not punishing anybody. There's no consequences going on. We're just simply using this strategy of a high P request sequence. An RBT is told to provide a grape to a client every three minutes, no matter what. The grape functions as reinforcement. What is the RBT conducting? There's been a few questions <clears throat> on this portion of the exam. 
where we've had keywords. And a lot of times, it's how the test is going to function. There are going to be keywords on the test which are going to give you the right answer. What is the keyword here? We have an RBT providing a grape to client every three minutes, no matter what. And the grape functions as reinforcement. This no matter what is our key. So what is the RBT conducting? Is it contingent reinforcement? Well, contingent reinforcement says, if you do something, then you do something. We're not contingent on anything. This is no matter what. Is it contingent punishment? It's not punishment. We're using grapes as reinforcement. Is it negative reinforcement? No, we're not taking anything away. We're giving the client something. We're using non-contingent reinforcement. The non-contingency is the idea that no matter what, you're getting reinforced. It's not contingent on anything. No matter what happens, you're going to get reinforcement. Every three minutes, no matter what, non-contingently, we're going to reinforce our client. So what is the RBT conducting? Non-contingent reinforcement. Finally, the primary characteristic of a punisher is what? So a punisher does what? Decreases behavior. That is the main thing you need to know about a punisher. Decreases. Is it an aversive? Doesn't have to be. As long as it decreases behavior, punisher. Is it large in size? Doesn't have to be. Does it decrease behavior? Yes, it has to decrease behavior to be a punisher. And is it removed following a behavior? Well, a negative punisher is, but not a positive punisher. So it's not a primary characteristic. The only primary character characteristic listed here is that a punisher decreases behavior. All right, thanks for watching. Check out rbtexamreview.com for all of our study materials. As always, please like and subscribe. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.